the, the new guy. Just like all he does is scrub the deck, right? And he is like, but there's no for shower facilities on this vessel. And they're like, we just wash up on shore. Oh. <laughs> 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 Oh, that's fantastic. Brilliant. Good morning. Morning. So, Good morning. How are you doing? Welcome all. Thank you very much. How are you doing? How is everybody? Not we're not online. Oh, we're on live. Oh, yeah. We're live right now. Yeah. 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 Ah, already live. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, Hi from Lima. Hi that. from Lima, Peru. Good morning and welcome everyone to another edition of the Digital Download, the longest running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live. I'm Rob Durant, and apparently the topic this week is my fault. So... <laughs> I will be uh, acting as the host. Uh, before we get into the topic, let's go around the horn uh, with some introductions. Uh, who wants to kick us off? Hello, I'm Alex, Alex. founder of Sapiro and proud DLA partner. Hello, all. William. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm William Shorten. Um, so I work for DLA as well and also run a consultancy, William Shorten Learning Solutions. Hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm Linwood Ross. I'm the founder and CEO of Accelery. We're a DLA Ignite partner. I'm based here uh, just outside New York City. Lorena. Hi, I am Lorena Borgo. I'm from Performa. I am also a DLA partner and I am based in Peru, in Lima, Peru. Tim. Uh, I'm Tim Hughes. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Night. Um, and, and welcome to everybody and, and um, welcome to people in the audience as well. Tracy. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm Tracy Borison, apparently a terrible joke teller, coming to you from <laughs> Calgary, Alberta, Canada, <laughs> this lovely morning, and shockingly, also a proud partner of you. Adam. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Gray from DLA Ignite. I'm Tim's business partner, and I've got the flu at the moment, so I'm going to be on mute most of the time <laughs> because I would be coughing. So, so what, what Rob could have done is last, and by all means least, Adam. Oh, thank you. Never, never, Adam. And I'm Rob Durant, uh, founder of Flywheel Results, uh, based in the Boston area, where it is negative 40 degrees outside uh, with the wind chill factor. Woo! The interesting thing about negative 40 degrees, that's the same temperature in Celsius as it is Fahrenheit. And that's pretty stinking cold really so welcome to another edition of the digital download uh as i said uh this started from a conversation we had earlier this week and uh kind of snowballed from there i was sharing with the team uh what i had been teaching to my college freshmen in their um career seminar. So the first thing that I shared with them was, if you want fruit from a tree, the best time to plant seeds is five years ago. The second best time is today. This week in the digital download, we're going to take a look at what upcoming professionals are being taught about career development and networking. It turns out much of what's shared with B-School students applies to those open to work and really anyone interested in career development. So that should be just about everyone. Uh, today we intend to examine uh, the importance of networking and how two thirds of the LinkedIn population is doing it wrong. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of IQ, EQ, 
and the World Economic Forum's recently coined LQ. And we'll share what effective networking looks like in today's world. I was telling my students, it's not about who you know. It's not about what you know. It's about who knows what you know. And finally, we will provide three simple steps anyone can do, everyone should do about it. So grab a midday snack or a breakfast burrito if you're in North America and join the conversation. Let's kick us off with this, uh, the importance of networking and how two thirds of the LinkedIn population is doing it wrong. That's a, a pretty bold statement. Where does that come from? Where does the bold Tim, statement gonna, come from? <laughs> yeah. Where, where, what are the oh, facts behind it? It comes from wrong. <laughs> yeah. Darn it. But Tim, did you not share with us I some did. insight? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, there was a, a new um, article that came out from, um, I think, it was Social Media World or something. Um, and um, LinkedIn have put out their new figures. And they're now at 900 million people. Oh, wow. Registered on the platform. Registered on the platform. It doesn't mean they're active using it, but they're registered on the platform. And they can see a, a trajectory going towards a billion, which is fantastic. You know, a billion... Um, they reckon there's a billion people. Well, the World Economic Forum reckons um, there's three billion people in work, which includes white collar as well as blue collar. So, it's, you know, um, that's a, getting close to a billion people that are connected. But they, LinkedIn also admit that there was it 310 million people are actually logging in. I think it's once a month. What they measure is that once a month. So um, about a third of the people, so two thirds of the people uh, are on there, but they're not doing anything with it. And I never remember how many people post content. Is it like 1% or 2%? Or something? Yeah, I think it's like, well, the old figure, the old figure was 3 million or 1% uh, were considered content creators, um, which is relatively low when you compare it to other um, platforms. Yeah, so it was like 1.7. So it's still low. I'm going to say I'm here, here. isn't that good enough? William, what we sorry, William, I stepped on. 1.7 and people are learning yeah. you are and you're building relationships. But I think here's the thing about based on my concept of like networking that works versus networking that doesn't. The tricky piece of social media is that I think a lot of people think they're connected if they're connected. So if you have a connection with a person or you have a lot of followers or any of those things, people think that that means they're connected. But networking is, I like the phrase that you use, Rob, like who knows what you know, right? And that's based on sharing what you know. So either it doesn't have to be in content, but sharing through conversation or somehow sharing so that other people know what you're about. Will. Will. Thanks, Tracy. And just picking up on that, I mean, I think I, I'd probably use the terms uh, passive and active uh, in terms of what you've described there. And I mean, it strikes me that even at 310 million, if the criteria of measurement is that you're on there once a month, it's it's a fairly low bar. So even out of those 310, although you say it's only a third of people who are using it, probably once you dig into the figures and you've then got somewhere between the 1% that Len would talked about and the kind of 310 million, you know, how many people are actually using it on a kind of regular basis and kind of contributing in some way? Yeah. So to answer uh, Martin's question, and I think someone else had a similar question, the 1 million, I'm sorry, the 1% or 3 million people that I was referring to is LinkedIn it's who LinkedIn considers to be content creators. Um, and I used to have that, you know, what a content creator was, their definition at my fingertips, but I do not have that. And I will look it up for you. 
I think it's an interesting thing, point that Martin brings up about content creators versus content reposters, because I think, especially historically on a corporate level, there's a lot of activity that's just based on like the business posts a post and then the employees repost it, right? So then does that look like instead of one business content creating, and we can break down. I'm excited to hear your definition. <laughs> well, it's actually LinkedIn's definition. I just can't remember. Right. But yeah. Um, yes, um, to the point, I think that Rob was asking, you know, why are so many people using LinkedIn in a way that, you know, we would consider to be, we meaning DLA Ignite and the DLA Ignite ecosystem. Um, why are why are they using it in a way that um, we would say is not the most useful way? It's um, how they're approaching it, right? So uh, you'll have a huge uh, portion of people who see LinkedIn as just a database. And they're going to use that database for their purpose. Um, and their purpose, um, you know, a lot of sellers on LinkedIn, their purpose is to make sales. So they see LinkedIn as a lead generation tool and they use it that way. I'm just in here trying to find people who meet my target audience. I want to connect with them as quickly as I can, pitch them as quickly as I can, and they're out. And then you have another group. They also see LinkedIn as a database and they're looking for a job. <laughs> so they're going and they're just using LinkedIn to find a job. And you have another group, they're looking, using LinkedIn to find people to hire, right? Just in this very isolated. Then you have this very small group of people that are using LinkedIn for relationship building, to generate conversation, okay? And um, in, from my perspective, that's the right approach uh, to how you should use LinkedIn. Um, and we can get into why I do that later, but, um, you know, that, that's, um, you know, I, that's how I would break it down. And that's why I would say we think, you know, easily two thirds are not using LinkedIn in a way that is digital forward. It's interesting, Lenwood, oh. those four groups that you talked about, the, yeah. the ones that are using it for uh, a selling platform, the ones that are using it to find a job, the ones that are using it to find candidates to fill jobs. LinkedIn actually sells specific solutions to each of those three target audiences. Yes. The one they yes. don't sell a solution to is the one that we're advocating for. Yeah. Be yeah. out there, be connecting. And there's really good reason for that, okay? It's called business. <laughs> <laughs> LinkedIn needs to make money. Okay, so even though, you know, LinkedIn is relatively old platform now, I think it's 20 years old, right? So um, it, the platform has evolved when it started when, it, you know, um, when they were going viral, and people were signing up and it was growing, you know, a 1000% every month or whatever the figures were rapidly exponentially growing um it was it was a different platform than it is today and the times were different than it is today and so linkedin um developed a you know business models to support itself as it continues to evolve just like all businesses will have to do use it as an example 20 years ago it was one thing today it's something different in five or ten years it will be something different again yeah so don't you think it's ironic then that um linkedin have designed initially a platform for uh, uh I guess reciprocation, two two way dialogue. Yet there's a heavy focus on commercializing, um, you know, commercializing the model, if you like, from a sales and marketing perspective. Getting yeah. their customers to do what actually has the opposite effect. Of yeah, it's 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 a it's really a conundrum because. Um, <laughs> 
you know, the reason that the bit, the reason that LinkedIn was um, able to grow as rapidly as it has grown, um, or all of the social media platforms, right? The reason they, it's actually, um, you know, just math. <laughs> you know, the, it's it's just networks, right? All these networks existed, and what these platforms were able to do was digitize those networks. Um, once they digitize the networks, and it's hard to remember back, they realized, okay, I've got this mass of people. How do I make money from that mass of people? And they've done that, and they've continued to adapt the platforms um, for the times. But now what has happened is we're kind of stuck in a old behavior uh, on LinkedIn, which made there was a time when what people are doing with LinkedIn still today made sense. But that time has passed. <laughs> so, so, Rob, i got a question for you. Sure. Um, you... Um... You're currently doing some lecturing with the students. What what do that what the students what what do they see about networks? Do they see a network as important? Do they see, um, you know, um, my my mother is 85 years old and and Adams is 88. They both have really strong networks. They actually see and it's, it's one of these things where they they actually they actually recognise the need that they know Frank down the road and whatever and and um and janice and stuff like that and they build these things even though they don't know what the word network is what do your students think i would say at this point they don't even know what the concept of networking is or having a network they have networks and they've shared with me oh yeah this is my group of friends this is my college friends these are my friends from back home and they connect with them through all of the, the different social apps, uh, TikTok, Snapchat, et cetera. But they've never, at least the ones that I've talked with, given any thought to intentionally building their network. And that was the piece that I loved sharing with them. I contend that for a college student, the best time in your life for being on LinkedIn is right now as a college student. Hence yeah. the, if you want fruit, uh, you know, plant the seeds today. But um, it was more about understanding that as a college student, reaching out to people and building your network, people will generally accept your LinkedIn connection request without question. You'll find that Nine out of 10 people you reach out to, if you have a decent message, if you're not spammy and not selling them something, they want to help college kids because most of us have been there before. And I told them, that's why it's so critically important to build up your network today. Get to at least 500. And 500 is a magical number. Yep. Because once you have 500 connection requests, somebody looking at your profile we'll see that you have 500 plus connections. 501 or 5,001 or 15,001, they'll never know. But that 500 is that magical network, magical number for your network because people like to connect with others that are connected. And we're all in that position. I agree, Rob. If anyone sends us a connection question, it's, you know, it's a nicely written, you know, I'm... I'm Stephen McKenzie, and I'm currently studying at um, uh, West Sussex University. I'm in my second year doing business. Um, and um, will you connect with me? Of course you would. Exactly. Uh, what I happens think, the day they get a job? I won't connect to them. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what I told okay. them. So I think there's an interesting piece of this, right? Because the like message you just made up, Tim, not like a, it's an authentic message, right? Like, this is me, this is where I'm currently at. I'm reaching out to connect with you. There's a practice in there that can transition into if you're job seeking, so the career development piece, if you are a salesperson trying to make connections, or running your own business and trying to make connections, or you're trying to get investment funding and you're trying to make connections, like sometimes I 
I, I think I've talked about this before on the show, but sometimes I'm just like, hey, I stumbled across your profile and you look like fun people. I think you should connect. And sometimes people accept it, sometimes people don't. But there's like an authenticity from my perspective that like literally this is why I am reaching out to connect with you. And if you're okay with that, then awesome. And if you're not okay with that, then awesome. So I think it's important from both sides for us to look at like how are we sending out connection requests? Is it intentional? like Rob mentioned, because I think a lot of things in the digital space lack intentionality. Um, but when we do have that intentionality, how do we show that? How do we show that we're being intentional with that? And then also when we're accepting, how do we equally do that? And lots of people raising their hands. Uh, how do we do that intentionally as well? So I think I saw Will first and then Lorena. Lorena I, I wanted, yes. to go to Lorena. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I was getting back to what um, I would like to get back to what Tim mentioned about networks and 80 plus people having them. And what I think is that uh, the word or the concept of network has been put into value uh, recently. I mean, maybe 30 years ago or something like that. Because I remember, for example, when people, when, when this, it, from a business view, from a business view, you know, use your network, build up your network. And really, uh, that time ago, it sounded like too uh, non-personal uh, and too uh, uh, cosification. Like, like uh, why are you going to use your network, your relations for some, something beyond uh, having a, a friendship or a contact or whatever. So I think the whole concept of networking has been evolving in the last years from a business perspective. And so it is right now on digital. So I think we, we are learning. And if you ask, for example, Robert, your students, they, they don't know about that because they, I, I think it's, we have to learn how to use our networks uh, from a business perspective, but not going beyond, uh, not thinking that it's uh, not right. So that's a little bit my, our, yeah. my thoughts about well, that. So I think to link some of these things together, I mean, first of all, I think Kenny makes a really good point in the chat about the kind of training that's required to support people to go through this. And I think this leads to kind of part of it, because if I, and I know things have changed a lot since I was 18 or 19. Um, a, little know, when we're, 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 a little bit. When we're developing networks, you know, it's very natural for us to, you know, we go through our academic uh, process will be very networked usually with the people who are in the same age group as us. Um, but sometimes that won't even kind of extend to a year above or a year below or two years above, which in, in time space is very short. But at that time in our life, it's like it seems like a massive step. So I think, you know, you then take it and say, well, we want you to be reaching out to kind of adults and the outside world. I mean, people just don't know kind of how to do that and they haven't got the confidence yeah. To do that. So there is something around mindset here, part of which is down to training, but part of it is to help demonstrate how useful this can be. And the fact, you know, we have these kind of limiting beliefs that we that we carry around with us that actually if I reach out, they're not going to be interested in what I have to say. They're not going to be interested in, in the invitation I'm sending, however well versed it is, you know, that's that's all the thought processes behind us. And so part of it is trying to understand, well, look what's the worst that is going to come out of this and, and we've all been through this i mean we've been through this probably most of us in the last two or three years as we've we've come over into the social world and and and, and given it a go and we're a bit more kind of mature and we've learned how to how to deal with it so there's something about yes the training and the support and also kind of saying look this is fine and it's not going to work every time but go out there and give it give it a go and you may be pleasantly surprised about what you managed to achieve can I uh, share a story with you? I think it will be helpful um, to thinking about how we should approach what we're doing on LinkedIn and actually overcome some of the mindset issues or limiting beliefs that we might have when we're working on LinkedIn. So when I was in college, um, uh, if I um, had maybe an interest in a girl that I might like to date, I don't know her, okay? I don't just go up to her and say, hey, you want to go out? You want to do something? No, that's not how I approach it. 
What I do is I say to myself, you know what? I'm going to have an interaction with this person and I'm just going to plant a seed. I'm going to plant a seed. I'm going to water that seed over time. And if I want to date her in the future, I'll be able to pull the trigger. Okay, so, well, <laughs> this maybe did I ended up in the friend zone. <laughs> but my point here is, my point here is that when you are on LinkedIn and you're thinking about relationship building, if you approach a person thinking, I specifically want to connect with them and ask them to buy something from me right this minute, that is most likely going to result in a no or, you know, whatever the approach is. We call it connect and pitch, okay? Because you're not interested in the relationship. You have to build the relationship first. And so when you ask, should we be teaching LinkedIn? I would say, no, we should not be teaching LinkedIn. What we should be teaching is relationship building. How do we build relationships at scale using LinkedIn? Okay, well, it's, net, it's, so, it's networking. It comes to you know that that, that word. It's not relation. Relationship building is is part of it, but networking, I think, is is the broader broader fit. Edward. Well, and I think there's also I, I, this isn't always the case because we've talked about different types of networks, but I think in the digital space, networking has become a lot more transactional. And there is very little relationship building in a transaction, right? If I need to go to the store and buy a bag of chips, I go to the store and I buy a bag of chips and it's not meaningful to me and I just do it, right? And a lot of what we're seeing in the digital space in terms of quote unquote networking, which I don't think any of us consider it actually real networking, but it is that transactional, right? Yeah. I've had people who are like, I won't talk to you unless you're interested in buying something from me. And I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah. That's I, I agree with that, Tracy. There's so many negative connotations associated with that term networking um, that I think it actually does more harm than good to think about it as networking. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but, um, you know, when I, if I think about it as, you know, when I think about it as relationship building, that immediately takes me out of a transactional mindset. I don't have to do because I'm building a relationship in this half hour conversation or in this, you know, interaction that I'm having. I don't need to get everything done. They don't need to learn everything there is to know about me. I don't need to learn everything there is to know about them because I'm starting something that's going to continue, you know, hopefully indefinitely. But that makes an assumption that people understand a what a networking is and they're comfortable with that. Um, when Adam and I were, were, were doing business in um, Singapore, um, one of the people said to us, you want me to connect to people I don't know? How do I do that? What's that about? And, and, and certainly in that culture, there was a very clear view that you wouldn't connect to people you didn't know or you would only connect to people you didn't know. Um, and probably you'd only connect to people that you'd shaken their hand or had some sort of uh, meeting with. Um, and I still think because of the way that we've now moved online, the number of networking events, it, it, you know, there's lots of, I, I see, I have by my desk, I've shown this before, a whole pile of business cards. Because it's kind of a window into a world where you used to go to networking events or meet people and use business cards. Someone drilling. Sorry, sorry. Rosh Aaron in Lima. <laughs> yeah. That's a networking event in Lima sound effect. <laughs> uh, and, um, um, and, and now people, and, and, and people aren't doing that. So there's a, and, and so I think what happens going back to the students, which is that actually saying to a student, well, why don't you reach out to these um, very old looking people? I'm talking about myself um, and connect with them and say, hi, I'm Steve. Um, can I connect? Is actually like a really scary, difficult thing to do, which is what we're very saying. much so. Very much so. And I remember, being that age and hating the just the word networking. Networking was a four letter word. Yeah. But the reason was because networking in my mind was, oh, it's all about who you know. And I didn't grow up in a family that 
knew a lot of influential business people. I grew up in a family of teachers and how networking, who, you know, that's unfair. If you want to get a sense of um, equity and fairness, speak to a college kid. They know all about what's fair. Uh, it's only as we become old and cynical that we realize, oh, life isn't fair and I just have to pick up the pieces and deal with it. They're not ready to pick up the pieces and deal with it yet. So that's where I was assuring them that it's more than just what you were born into. It's more than just who you know. Yeah. And I also have a section of honors students. I can relate to them as well. Going through school, I was an honors student. And I was of the belief that, you know, if I just got the right grades, then the next thing would come to me. And guess what? It didn't. <laughs> but when you put together who you know with what you know, and you start to make those connections so that people know you and know what you know, that's when I started to get traction. And oh, by the way, that's when I really started to enjoy networking. Me, I'm, I'm a teacher at my core is what I like to say. Where, really where that stems from is I'm a helper. I'm a helper at my core and teaching is the way that I do that. Networking for me is getting to know somebody new, figuring out what they might have going on and, and where I can contribute. Um, Malcolm Gladwell in, in his book, um, The Tipping Point, talks about connectors. And, and it's all about seeing this person over here with this need and, and meeting this person over there that solves this problem and putting them together. That for me is fabulous. That's networking. And, and that's what I'm trying to instill in the students. And I laughed at the comment earlier, do you think this should be taught? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. And, and I'm kind of doing it in a skunk works way because LinkedIn wasn't really a major part of the lesson plan until I doctored it a little bit. Can, can I um, connect the thought that Tim had and your thought, Rob? And it's this idea of um, how do I talk to or engage with someone that I don't know? So when we think about the event, like the conference, right, where people we don't know come together and somehow we find something to talk about, what's the thing that is bringing that group together is the content. It's the speaker that they've invited to talk about a specific issue. Okay, so that brings people from all around the world who we don't know to a single location, right, a physical location, where we're all going to focus on this thing that we care about. And if I want to network in that environment, all I need to do is say, what did you think about what the speaker said about X, Y, and Z? And this is what I think about. And so now we're having a conversation with someone we don't know, and we're getting value from it, right? That same principle applies to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. We can begin to have conversations with people we don't know when we focus on the content, the thing that's bringing us together in this particular moment in time, a post or what have you, and we engage them about that content. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Very similar to uh, Ahmed's comment, you know, it, 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 networking one person may Pretty feel good. that someone is, is is close and the other one uh does not believe the relationship is is close at all that's exactly uh what happens in these types of transactions and whether it it's close or not it's the start of something or it's the start of nothing and, and tracy you've talked about where others have said, well, I only connect if we have a call or I only connect if you're going to, to buy something from me. And very quickly, you weed out those that aren't aligned with how you want to move forward. 
It's it's swipe left or swipe right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, and I think too, it's interesting. I uh, like I hosted a conversation a while ago, and, and Ledwin was there. And one of the things that came up in that conversation was like, how much do you reveal about yourself, right? Because I feel like if you're the person in the party who feels like there's a closeness, it's probably because you've revealed something about yourself that you haven't don't reveal to all people, right? And I, these are the types of things too that you. It, it takes practice, but you get to like pulse check them, right? Like, oh, I revealed this type of information and this person is not interested in going there at all. So although I think maybe there might be something here and that person isn't playing my game and I'm just going to leave, leave it. And at the same time, no two people are ever having the exact same experience, right? So you mm -hmm. may not know what's going on. These are real people, right? So real people have lives that exist outside of whatever conversation you're having. They have challenges, they have emotions, they have experiences that you don't know about. And I think there's like, again, when we talk about moving away from a transactional interaction, we're talking about it's just being more human, right? Are we being, are we being supportive? Are we being compassionate? Are we, are we being these things mm -hmm. in the digital space? Because would probably would be like if somebody was sitting next to you crying, you probably would just like give them a minute and be like, eh, I had this scenario with my four year old yesterday, but like this, this person needs a minute, right? Uh, and, Rob, Rob, at the beginning, yes. so, sorry, Tracy, um, sorry, um, at the beginning, you talked about the World Economic Forum, yes, and, and this thing called LQ. So I know what IQ is and EQ is. So what's LQ? I took it to mean learning quotient. It does. How well you are at um, understanding new concepts. Now, it's great to have a great LQ, but you have to sharpen that sword too. That's kind of what I, I got from watching that video of the World Economic Forum. I know, Adam, I'm sorry, Alex, you had made reference to it as well. What did you take from that? Yeah, there's, um, so I think um, in line with what Tracy was just saying and what Lem was saying about um, uh, building relationships, for me, that sits within that continuous learning kind of thread um kind of before we go to what was said on on the video i think the problem we have the challenge we have is we're all sitting here with a lot more freedom than most so we've had the kind of freedom to try this stuff and we know it works it works really really well especially if you want to speak to 5 10 15 new people a week the problem is most people don't have that freedom and they have the pressure of business pushing down on them saying, how many meetings have you made? Is that conversation qualified? And they don't ever get the freedom to, to learn these new skills effectively. And so when I think about that continuous learning spectrum thread, um, you know, I, I kind of start to think about, well, who who is responsible? Is it the individual? Maybe, but then are they allowed? Do they have the freedom to do the continuous learning that they want to? Is it the employer? Is it the universities? And the was it the UAE minister talked about the fact that... Um, in the UAE, they want the universities to stay engaged with the learners, the alumni for their for their life, their career. Free of charge. Free of charge, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or is it the government? You know, where does that who's accountable? Where does it the responsibility sit? Cause, you know, for me, I, I'm the best thing I ever did was to learn this new skill, thanks to to Tim and Adam really kind of opened my mind to the art of the possible, but I wouldn't have had the freedom to do that if I wasn't running my own business. Right. 
Well, this is actually a problem, this learning quotient problem, this challenge of how do we do, how do we do learning? How do we do any of this stuff when the environment that we're in is moving so rapidly, right? Business is changing so quickly. And that's really the fundamental problem, actually. Um, General Stanley McChrystal said about the war in Iraq, he said, you know, the U.S. Army has all the skills, we have all the technology, we have all the resources that we need, but we're still losing. And the reason he said that they were still losing is because the battlefield was changing so rapidly. They were ill-equipped for the environment in which they had to operate in. And so that's where he came up with this idea of the team of teams, that really the issue is adaptability and interoperability, is having teams that are moving very quickly and able to work well with one another. This is the same challenge that we face in business today, that we can't operate because the world that we live in, the digital world is an exponential world, we cannot afford to approach things in a linear way. Like Alex was saying, hey, we don't have time to stop our work and start learn and learn and then come back to our work. We, that, that approach no longer works because the world is moving too quickly. So what we have to do is actually learn while we are working. We have to integrate our skill development with projects that solve business problems. That has to happen because the world's moving too fast to do it in a linear way. I think that's a great way to learn, though, when you're learning on the job. But but it's not. Um, uh, it it if, when you don't have the freedom to learn properly, where well, you've still got that pressure. Oh, you've been doing you've been learning that for two months. What are the results? It's like okay, yeah. hang on. Yeah, that's. I mean, and and that's that's why the the learning, especially from a business perspective. The learning has to be in the context of solving a business problem. So as we are solving this business problem, we are going to learn the skill that's going to help us to solve it. Yeah, and have the support from the leadership. Team. And have the support from the, that helps you with the support from the leadership because leadership is all about time and money, right? And so we don't have time to everybody stop and then go and learn. No, 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 that, that won't work. If you can solve, if you can learn the thing you need to know, and solve a business problem for me. Now I'm on board with you. Uh, so anyway, that's that is. Um, well, and, and well, interestingly enough, the leaders uh, that they has assembled for this conversation at the World Economic Forum, they were really talking about that. They were dancing around this issue of continuous learning or learning quotient and adaptability and how do we make this an ongoing process um, and i think from their perspective they saw the biggest challenge as being with the individual because yeah. um, even when i graduated from school you know the thinking was okay i've learned now i go and i start work yeah. and i work and my learning is my learning is sort of over. Yeah. Okay, today, uh, and I think the minister of education for the uh, for the UAE was said this most succinctly. What we need to think about is the university is going to give the basic skills, yeah. and when we graduate, that's when the learning starts. Yeah. Um, and and there's a role for the employer to keep up with that continuous learning. Um, it has to get into the culture. Not, I would say, some people say it's, it's the business culture, but really it's the culture overall. Everyone needs to get on board with this idea that we have to keep learning because what we learned five years ago is not going to be applicable today. And what we're learning today, it's not gonna be applicable in five years. So that's why all these things have to be happening simultaneously, continuously. Um, that's that's the road to the solution. Well, can yeah. I just throw, I, I agree, I agree with everything that has been said. And I do think like one of the things after your original question, Rob, that I thought was that like individuals have to choose that, 
Like we have to choose to want to keep learning, right? Because if you have a, a business culture that says, this is what we do, and we continuously learn, and you're like, no, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm just going to sit here and do my job. Well, hopefully they wouldn't hire you in the first place if that was actually the business culture. But as individuals, we have to choose that. And then there's also, like I've had in my personal experience where someone wanted me to learn a specific thing in the way they did it. Like they wanted me to learn their way of how to negotiate. And I couldn't because it never felt good to me. Didn't feel like I was negotiating for a good value exchange. It felt like I was negotiating to win. And I'm a collective contribution type of person, right? And so there's also this kind of individual personal brand, personality piece that plays into how effective are we going to be with our own learning quotient. And like my learning quotient and what I want to learn is different than Len Woods and Rob's and Tim's and Will's, right? Like, and so how do we take that into consideration in the business perspective and how do we create space for that so we actually optimize the learning portions of each of our employees? So I, I think there's a lot, lot, lot to unpack here, and we could go down many different avenues. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, my, my feeling for, for what it's worth. So, if you look at some more enlightened educationalists at the moment, they say actually the education system is broken. We need to redesign the whole education system, going right the way back to elementary school, because what we're basically doing is kind of pushing information, and you know, kids aren't necessarily interested in, in, in some of that. You know, what we tend to focus on is the stuff that really interests us. So, so it comes back to your point, Tracy, that actually if we're told to learn something in a particular way, that, that's not necessarily going to, um, uh, you know, going to kind of interest us. So, you know, the education system that we've got was designed for the Industrial Revolution, and it was basically a, a form of childcare to keep kids off the street. And we haven't really evolved that that much since then. So there's, there's something around actually how we design the education system to, to start off with. To come back to your point about learning on the job, you know, in terms of adult re research, what they'll say about learning is it's a rule of 70, 20, 10. 70% 70 of what we learn is on the job. 20% is by shadowing somebody and seeing how to do something. And 10% is actually going and taking part in some form of, um, you know, standard training so how do we how do we kind of motivate people to to go towards this so so one of it is one thing i think is around you've got to create the right context for it to happen so yes a lot of the responsibility lies with the individual but if you've got an individual in an organization that doesn't value training and doesn't give them the opportunity to grow then it doesn't matter how motivated you are you're not you're, you're not going to do it but it does have to start with 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 you and i think starting with you it comes down to you can use learn lq if you want you know carol dweck talked about a fixed and open mindset so actually it's having that ability to see things differently and not just say well i've been trained to do this and i'm going to just stick in that 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 particular lane i'm going to kind of broaden the approach that i'm i'm going to take so you know part of it then is with the individual that you have to have that kind of motivation and then, you know, with that, how collectively can we then tap into that into an organization? So Peter Senge w talked about the kind of five disciplines, talked about collective intelligence and collective learning. And to come back to Lenwood's point about the VUCA environment we're, we're working in, that's where you've got to kind of tap in and utilize that because that's how you can then adapt and adjust to the environment and context in which you find yourself in a way that's going to be meaningful and in a way that the whole organization is going to be able to benefit from it. One of the so when we started this, um, I alluded to uh, providing three simple steps you anyone do. can do, everyone should do about this. But b before I get into that, Alex, did you have something you wanted to share with us? I did. Um, so I think everyone on this call knows that I work with my two eldest sons and uh, love love the fact that we can work together and they have the freedom to to grow and follow their career i'm quite lucky lucky about that that they want to work with their dad so my third son is doing his gcse's he's 15 he's the one of the youngest in the in the year and um you know he he does struggle with maths and english 
and there's pressure on kids today to do well in maths and English, but he enjoys media and he enjoys creating content. So I'm hoping, um, and I think I can do this. I've looked into, I've started to look into it. Even as a small company, I can offer him a, um, uh, an apprenticeship. And so, you know, all being well, and he does well in his exams, he, he can join, join Superior. Uh, later this year but he did a bit of work in english which he struggles in and i wanted to just read it out to you because it's so topical and the date the date's the first of the first of february it's just coincidental it says um education is key to the youth of this day and age the education system in school is still good to learn from especially at a young age but as we mature, the outside world becomes our classroom. Nice. Boom. Which, which I just thought was amazing. And his te the feedback his teacher gave him, I'm not naming any names, was, that's annoyingly brilliant, Jude. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, were you his teacher? <laughs> that, that sounds like an Adam response. It, it does. Uh, I'm just annoying. <laughs> <laughs> So this started with me telling my students, it's all about who knows what you know and, and the power of LinkedIn and how this is the, the time in your life where you can best leverage it. Of course, they then turn to me and say, well, how do you do it? I, I won't pretend to be a LinkedIn expert. Uh, there are plenty of LinkedIn experts that will sell you the course on that. But I did share with them three basic tenets. And these foundations that you can uh, build on and grow from. And truly, I believe this is what anyone can do to be more effective, not just on LinkedIn, but in networking in general, whether it's digitally or in the real world. First and foremost, be approachable. On LinkedIn, that means, you know, having a, a, a decent profile, um, filling in some of the blanks, uh, making sure that you're open to receiving connection requests, that they don't have to know your email address to even send you that request. Next, be sociable. If you want to be part of the conversation, first and foremost, be part of the conversation. Comment, like, interact with other posts, and then, ever so brave, start to put your own thoughts out there. And, and honestly, that was really intimidating to the students. And then I asked them, well, don't you post on, on Snapchat all the time? Don't you... Uh, have an Instagram account? Yeah, but that's different. Uh, I know, I know. LinkedIn isn't Facebook, right? <laughs> but put your thoughts out there related to the things that you're interested in, the professional things that you're interested in. And then finally, third step, be helpful. Again, back to the, the commenting and connecting and, and, and so on. Be approachable, be sociable, be helpful. And I think with that, you're going to, to find your way, whether it's this social platform, some other social platform, or just in general, people will gravitate towards that. Rob, can I, can I add to your list? Please. Two things that I think um, would be helpful for those people who are especially introverted, and I don't know what to say. Be curious, ask questions. Absolutely. Be curious, ask questions. That goes so far. You know, if you go, anyone who is posting on LinkedIn or engaged in a conversation on LinkedIn, if you ask them a question about what they said, I mean, it's, it, can't, it doesn't get much easier than that. You don't, you don't really have to generate much yourself. You just ask the question. But yeah. Building on that, Lenwood, I think as well, there's something you know, and it depends on your stage, but but also reaching out and asking for a bit of help. Oh, yeah. yeah. Be humble. 
Humility, <laughs> asking for help, man, that goes so far. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I just wanted to add on to that concept of being sociable, because Lenwood brought up the introversion, right? There's not one way that sociable looks, right? It's based on who you are and what feels sociable to you. It's not about saying like, oh, sociable means I have to get on a LinkedIn Live with six other people and talk about a topic. <laughs> It might, it might look like that. Um, it doesn't have to, right? It can look like just asking a question. Honest curiosity, I think is one of, like it's one of my favorite things, I know, because it's like, oh, this is, I, I haven't had to explain this to somebody in a long time. This is awesome, right? This is, and we all have a unique, I speak about this a lot about your, like, what do you wonder? Hashtag, what do you wonder? Follow it if you want to. Um, I just, I just, <laughs> There's not that much content related to it. Um, but all of it, like every person has a unique thing that they wonder, right? Like you go to school and there's specific subjects that you're innately interested in, right? Wonder about that. Ask questions about that. Connect with people who are in those fields, right? It's just, it doesn't have to be connect with all people so you have a big network, right? Connect with people who seem interesting to you. Be sociable in your way. And there's a little bit of, trial and error that exists in there too right show up one way and then you're like oh no that doesn't feel like me and that's okay that's part of the learning process it's part of the learning portion and i think that oftentimes on like personal branding front people think especially coming out of college that you should just know right like i should know how i would authentically connect with someone online you don't you don't you mostly have other people telling you who you should be and most of us get really good at being who we should be and it's about exploring who are we actually how would i actually do that and it there's there's some failure that exists in there as well yeah and for business you know, that, leaders, yeah go ahead uh, for business leaders uh the closing comments on the uh, world economic forum uh was that if Every person, I think there's 3.8 billion workers out of the 8 billion global population. If every person learned one skill and that skill was collaborative problem solving, it's worth $2.5 trillion to our global economy. Ooh, I love what, it. <laughs> what, 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 what would it be worth if every person learned to digital network? To our Maybe we should work that out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What would it be worth to someone's business if everyone within their organization learned how to do what we're talking about today? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. We should, Tracy, we should I just, work that out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wanted to come back to, I don't even remember now <laughs> specifically what it was that you said, but something that you said reminded me what else I told the students. <laughs> That's the I the, calculator yeah, he's, he's going to need a bigger calculator. calculator. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I told the students, this isn't about becoming an influencer with a capital I. And, and that's their perception of all of this. Networking on a digital stage is about being a social media influencer. No, not at all. It's just about getting more people to know what you know and learning from them equally. Sounds good. <laughs> so, uh, but, but can I, uh, two, two minutes. So, so um, yeah. add to your three and, and the two that um, Renwood and Tracy and uh, in We're gonna need two stone tablets in a in, moment. In <laughs> <laughs> encouragement. I, I, I always, whenever, whenever I sit down and, and, and I think, what can I say? It's what can I do to encourage? And it's the, um, there's that um, uh, net, um, comedy, comedy thing where you do the um, improv comedy, where, um, which they, you can bring into business, which is to not say when someone comes up with an idea, yeah, usually what happens is you say, yeah, but, you know, yeah, we can't do that because of, you know, what we should be doing is saying, yes, and we could do this. And it's that improv comedy uh, thing. And that's that encouragement, I think, is so key. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that brings us to the uh, top of the hour. Another uh, successful show. I want to thank 
all of the uh, panelists, of course. It's great to see you every week. I want to thank, thank all of the um, viewers, all of the comments, some great contributions from the audience this week. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone again next week on the digital download. And I'm looking forward to when Jordan um, Abbott comes on. Absolutely. Yeah. Being as I know that he's in the audience now, Jordan, we want you on. You, we want you. We want the younger people. generation. Yeah, yeah. You, we want you to come and contribute to this. Yeah, Look, absolutely. everybody's saying yes. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, yeah. come, on, come, on come on, come on, come on. All right, that does us. Bye all.